the chaos, the fear of chaos, that's it. But the anxiety has everything to do with the body, doesn't it? With the possibility that the body will be dismembered, that it will absolutely, be left alone. Absolutely, destroyed, mm -hmm. yes. You see, the human condition for me is the relation of man to woman. And I was brought up in a family where the violence was present. And one of the things that my mother did, when the anxiety of my father crept up, she knew that before every meal, so she put a little pile of sauces next to, her, next to his plate. When anxiety came, <laughs> you see, and, and that noise, for him it cleared the air. It cleared the air. He felt better, right? How did you feel? Uh, I, I felt relieved because I stopped being afraid of what was going to happen. It had happened, right? Right. From the cluttered maze of her studio, Bourgeois puts together the contents of what she calls her cells. Small rooms full of bottles, bodies, writings, stuffed dresses, environments filled with the traces of memory. Living in America has clearly given your work opportunities that it might not have had in Europe. Do you I, I grant you, yeah, yeah. that's true. That's what, true, that's true. What were those opportunities and, and, and do they make you feel like an American rather than a European artist? That, that in this country, everything, anything goes. It is a great freedom. You can be as crazy as you want and uh, th this is freedom. And in Europe, you are absolutely the prisoner of an establishment. So I'm very grateful for that. Nobody is going to tell me what to do in the first place, and nobody is going to tell me that it is good, bad, or indifferent. And indeed the artist, especially the well-known artist, is free in America. He or she gets total latitude, often at great expense. This pavilion in a Los Angeles garden is a piece by James Turrell. It contains nothing but air, and from it, you watch the sky. The work is called Second Meeting. As the sun sets, the contrast between the artificial light inside and the natural light outside makes that perfectly cut square become almost palpable. I put you in a situation where you feel the physicality of light. This is an art that people try to touch, and yet there's nothing to touch. There is, first of all, um, no object, and there is no image, nor any place of focus. What are you then looking at? Well, I'm hoping that you then have the self-reflexive act of looking at your looking, so that you're actually seeing yourself see to some degree, and it does reveal something about your seeing as opposed to being a journal of my seeing. Terrell's art doesn't happen in front of your eyes. It happens behind them. Since the late 70s, Terrell's big project has been to turn a whole crater on the edge of the painted desert in Arizona into a work of art. How did you come upon the Roden Crater? Through flight. A lot of how I come about uh, this look at space and light inhabiting it is through flight. I flew the Western States to look at a site where I could make a series of spaces that literally did engage the visual world above as you engage it in flight. Generally, I would fly for about three or four days and sleep under the plane at night. Basically, that was the life I had for about seven months. I literally was looking for this bowl-shaped space held up in the air. But then at the end of the seven months, you came on the Roden Crater, and that was it? That was it. I liked the color of it. I liked its position. Of course, I wanted to find one that was privately owned and for sale. And in the end, I had to buy a ranch to get a volcano.
Inside this great volcanic hill, Tyrrell plans tunnels, viewing chambers, and pools acting as lenses of water that will enable the visitor to experience the light of the sun, the moon, and the stars in isolated, concentrated ways. It's an American vision on an epic scale, not just painting the Western landscape, but subtly transforming it. I've selected the crater, first of all, an environment that is exposed geology. And in this stage set of geologic time, I then wish to make spaces that engage celestial events in light, so as to play the music of the spheres in light, simply. Very simple, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I must say, in looking at the plans, it doesn't seem so simple, and perhaps it isn't in that respect. But when you greet my work with your perception, it is quite a simple act. Tell me something, when you um, got here, was the crater rim like this, or did you have to do a lot of bulldozing? Oh, no, it's been shaped. So it still looks like a volcano, but it's now trued up a bit, as I'd say. What, you had caterpillars up there slicing yes. off the top, huh? Yes. Basically, the whole shaping was done so as to shape the sky. It took about 220,000 cubic yards of moving before that began to happen. OK, well, one of the things I'd like to have you do is to lie down and see the horizon from that position. Where you should I, where do we do it? Right here is a good place, okay. right here. I'll, I'll shade you. All right. Just right back, huh? Yes. Wow. Framed in the arc of the rim, you see the sky as a huge blue dome, all embracing, transparent, but somehow solid, an eyeball. This is almost where we came in, the vision of America as a sublime wilderness far in the west. But the God-given blank slate that Europeans thought they had has been written over again and again for the last 400 years. So much so that we've now got postmodernists saying that nature is just another cultural construct and that art doesn't need it. Well, you can tell that one to the coyotes. None of us is outside of nature. We are all a part of nature, a bad, ungrateful part sometimes, but part of it all the same. And an art that doesn't take that into account isn't going to satisfy us or delight us for very long. The world is so various, so interconnected, that it still remains the best ground of invention. That inventiveness, that sense of possibility, is flagging badly in America now, as it is in the rest of the world. American art seems to be losing the two qualities that once made it special, its plain empirical speech and its spiritual hopes. All cultures decay and the culture of American modernism, once so vital, so open, and so confident, may be no exception to that as we move towards the year 2000. I think of the words of W.B. Yeats, the best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. But then again, in the equally durable words of Scarlett O'Hara, tomorrow is another day.
Visit American Visions at PBS Online and further explore the American experience through art at the address on your screen.